Well, today we have uh, Jane Durston from Restorative jo uh, Gloucestershire joining us. And Jane will speak about uh, a neighbourhood mediation and hate crime case that she was involved with, where uh, one or more of the participants had English as an additional language needs. So, uh, Jane, it would be great to hear a few more details from you about this case. OK, no problem at all. Um, so this was a referral that came in to us through the police, actually. Um, and the referral reason um, was that both participants would like to be civil to each other and be able to live on the street harmoniously. So they lived in a terraced row and there was one house in between the two of them. And um, Alessandra was uh, Czech Roma and she was interviewed where she admitted the offence but was released under investigation and statements from the victim and witnesses had to be taken. Um, Hazel was also spoken to about her behaviour um, and it was recorded that the offence could be dealt with in slow time. So on the referral it says both parties have been spoken to and would like this issue to be solved restoratively. So Alessandra was going to need a Czech interpreter and we had one mobile telephone number for Alessandra which belonged to her daughter Miranda. Um, and the police have been liaising with Miranda, which was quite difficult because she was in her teens and obviously you don't want to share too much. Uh, so that was simply to set up appointment times, as I gather. Um, so there were the offence in particular was ABH and racially aggravated public order. Um, there had been ongoing issues due to noise complaints um, because Hazel was feeling that um, Alessandra and her family were always playing music until the early hours of the morning and this was very bass heavy loud music um, and the police were called um, due to reports of a fight outside. So the fight was actually between Hazel and Alessandra in the street. Um, Hazel had gone over to speak to Alessandra and her family because they'd been playing their music all night long and she was somebody who had to get up for early shifts. So this then turned into a confrontation um, and Hazel was racially abusive and um, Alessandra actually lashed out at her physically so they, they broke out into a fight. So on arrival the witnesses informed the police that um, one had assaulted the other um, and uh, Alessandra and her family felt quite sort of intimidated and, and therefore were hostile towards the police and they couldn't really get a representation of what happened. Um, so um, unfortunately Alessandra was actually taken away to the um, police station and you know was only in her pyjamas at the time so that was pretty humiliating for her. Uh, her neighbour Hazel um, is also mixed race so um, had a huge amount of problems with being described as racist and couldn't imagine herself kind of in that role. So where we began was really the, the initial difficulties were around how do we get in touch with Alessandra in the first instance because we were aware that her daughter was going to be at school and it wasn't necessarily appropriate to contact her anyway. So I guess one of the first things was to get in touch and find a Czech um, translator. And the nearest one that we had was in Wales, which is about, um, it was just over the border, but nonetheless, it was still about an hour away. So before we could even make any contact on the phone or anything else, we had to ask the interpreter if she could um, translate a letter for us to go into the post with a proposed appointment time. And also with a translation about our leaflet and um, seeing if that would be a convenient time for us to go out to the house and to let us know if not. And we heard nothing. <laughs> Gosh, um, well, you've spoken a bit about the barriers that you faced, including having to source an interpreter from Wales, which was over an hour away. Yes. Were there any other barriers that you faced when working with people who had English as an additional language needs or working with interpreters? Um, I think as well, well, there were obviously things like no responses to telephone calls and we don't really like to go around and, and just sort of um, doorstep people like knock on their door unannounced because we realise that can be kind of quite intimidating. Um, so, yes, um, um, even though we sent this appointment out and received no response, we did actually arrive at the property with the translator and there was no response, no car. Um, and, you know, we waited quite a while, but nobody returned. Um, and then the letter was received, but one of the issues that we hadn't realised was that the family also had literacy issues. So despite the fact that it had been translated, appointment times given, none of them had read it because they couldn't read. So this was really challenging. Um, and, you know, eventually we did manage to make contact by continuing to pop round. And 
we went round at a time where the daughter and the husband were also in. So just briefly managed to get ourselves understood enough to make an appointment time when we could call the translator back from Wales and then meet with the family. It sounds um, like uh, quite a lot, a lot of, of work to done to overcome those barriers. Yes, just, um, just those initial words, yeah. Uh, were there any other uh, hurdles and, and if so, how did you overcome them? Um, so, so other hurdles were, were kind of like, um, well, the obviously her daughter and her husband were both in the kitchen and um, her daughter had some quite strong views about what had happened too. And her husband had extremely strong views about what had happened. So um, it was actually quite important for us to try and kind of separate the incident between these two women and, you know, how we could go around resolving that. Whether they would need a supporter and who would that appropriate supporter could be. So um, although we, we put this to them, she was actually quite happy once she had to come to trust us and start to build a relationship with us that provided it was just going to be the two women plus myself and my co-facilitator, she was actually willing to attend that meeting. So we were really pleased with that, but it took quite a lot of perseverance um, and we had to um, really kind of look at our uh, body language and everything else. We had to try and ensure that the translator herself didn't have too much prejudice. And, and that became apparent at a couple of points that being a Czech translator is one thing, but working with the Roma family, some, some Czech Slovakian people also have, um, you know, quite an attitude towards them. Um, and, you know, there were one or two cultural things that she was she was able to explain, which were helpful. So, for example, um, on a sunny day, um, Czech Roma families apparently may not wish to kind of stay indoors. They might want to seize the day, be spontaneous and go out and they might not set as much store by a kind of official appointment someone else might um, so it's not a criticism but that was quite useful for us to understand it's not that they didn't care or didn't want to engage it's just that it was not necessarily a priority to them that's really helpful um, it, and it makes you think about all the um, additional issues that you, you might face when when working on such a case such as uh, um, prejudice on behalf of, of one or more parties including possibly uh, the interpreter yeah. So that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and then what was the uh, resolution to this case? Um, well, we actually did manage to get them both to a face to face um, conference in a neutral environment. Um, and one thing that we were quite conscious of was um, the the um, Czech Roma lady. It was it seemed to me to be quite important for her to have her voice heard first. And that's because everything that she was hearing in that meeting was coming to her second, if, if you see what I mean. Um, and that seemed to work quite well for her. Um, so we went through all the usual restorative questions, um, you know, according to what's happened, how have you been affected, who else has been affected, you know, what do you think needs to happen to make things right? Uh, and they were actually able, to, we used a script as well, which I think was, was really helpful. We had to keep the pace slow enough um, for the interpreter to be able to understand. We had to go to some length to explain to the interpreter what a restorative process would look like. Um, and neither party bought um, a supporter either. So it was, in a sense, um, the translator kind of didn't exactly become a supporter, but she was able to get things across. Um, and she had by that stage got to know her and actually walked down to the venue with her to show her where it was and called for her first. So I think she felt a little bit more of an alliance um, and that she was being supported sufficiently there. Um, they actually ended up sort of talking about what had happened. They worked out a plan for um, how they were going to approach things in future so that they could come and speak to one another if the music was too loud rather than reporting directly to the police. Um, one apologised for the racist language that was used and the other apologised for the assault. Um, they made an agreement about times of the day that they could turn the music down and, as I say, being able to approach one another in the event that something happened again. So they had the reintegration part of the meeting, which is where the formal bit is done. Um, and, you know, we had some teas and coffees. And it was quite interesting that they actually chose to leave together. Uh, and outside, we observed them um, shaking hands and lighting up a cigarette and walking, walking off together. <laughs> so, um, as far as we know, we've had no further reports of any incidents or referrals from the police ever since. So we're we're very hopeful that that was that. 
That's great. I mean, and it's so positive that they were able to come to agreements on some of the key issues that had caused conflict between them in the past. Mm. So that sounds like a really uh, successful outcome for everyone involved. What would what were their own personal feelings about taking part in restorative justice? Uh, I think they were both really, really keen. Um, once they realised that you know this was a this was being offered as an alternative to going down a more formal route. Um, so whilst we recognise that it's always um, a voluntary process, they they were kind of aware. Well, both of these offences, you know, could be subject to criminal proceedings, and neither of them had a criminal record prior to that. So I think it was quite an incentive to deal with it in this manner. Um, and it would have affected employment prospects. They were both actually um, women who had jobs and worked at different hours of the day, but both quite sort of physical and, and manual jobs too. So it, it would have clearly impacted on them with their employers. Um, so I think, yeah, they were, they were pretty motivated to do that. Um, they didn't either of them want to fill out um, written feedback or anything for us afterwards, which is was a challenge, but, um, but I think uh, as I say, I think it was it was nice to see them walking away in the manner that they did with no prompting from us. And being able to even u unite over a cigarette. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a really um, successful process um, and that you were able to navigate all the hurdles and barriers really well. Uh, so thank you um, for, for talking about this case with us today. And, uh, and all, the, all the best with the future cases that you'll be working on. Thank you very much.